This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. Today's episode is about the Stockbridge Muncie community, who call themselves the people of the waters that are never still. The Mohican people, part of the Eastern Algonquin family of tribes, occupied large areas of land in what is now New England and the Hudson River Valley, including parts of what is now Vermont, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, and were neighbors to the Lenape, to whom they are related. The Mohican people lived near rivers to be close to food, water, and transportation. They lived in wigwams and longhouses, The women generally tended the home and gardens, and the men hunted and fished. In the spring, they would tap the maple trees and gather the sap for syrup in a ceremony welcoming spring. Over time, the Mohican people and the Muncies, who were also Lenape, and whose language and lifestyles were similar, affiliated with each other. In 1609, Dutch trader Henry Hudson sailed up the Mahakanatuk, the river that flows both ways, into Mohegan land. By 1614, there was a Dutch trading post established on a nearby island to take advantage of the beaver and otter availability. The arrival of Europeans changed the Mohegan economic pattern as the Mohicans were driven out of their land and found themselves dependent on the white people, rather than on Mother Earth. Tensions between the Europeans and between the Mohicans and the Mohawks over the fur trade erupted into the Beaver Wars in 1628 and drove the Mohicans west by the early 1700s into what would become Massachusetts and Connecticut. The Europeans also brought their diseases and their religion with them. Some Mohicans, seeing that the Europeans were more prosperous than they were, were willing to try Christianity. Missionary John Sargent came to live with the Mohicans in their village of Wanaktatuk in 1734, teaching the Christian religion and baptizing some of the Mohicans. The European inhabitants renamed the village Stockbridge, after a village in England. Other native people came to hear the missionaries' teachings, including the Wappingers, the Neantics, Brothertons, Tunksies, Pequot, Mohawk, Narragansett, and Oneida. And the tribal group became known as the Stockbridge Indians. The Stockbridge Mohicans fought with the colonists in the Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812. But when they returned home, they were no longer welcome in Stockbridge. The Oneida offered the Stockbridge Mohicans part of their land, near Oneida Lake in New Stockbridge, where they flourished, but it was short-lived. Land companies proposed that New York State remove all Indians. The Stockbridge Mohicans moved on again, this time to the White River area in what is now Indiana, where they could settle among their relatives, the Miami and the Lenape, also referred to as the Delaware. After traveling for a year to reach White River, They discovered that the Delaware had been coerced into selling their land. 
In 1822, a treaty was negotiated between agents from the state of New York and commissioners for the War Department, with the Menominee and the Ho-Chunk, for the New York Indians to relocate to land in what is now Wisconsin. The Stockbridge Mohicans moved from Indiana to Wisconsin and built a village on the Fox River at Grand Cacklin, also called Statesburg. They were moved again to areas on the east shore of Lake Winnebago in 1834. Fearing further removal west after President Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act, some of the Stockbridge Mohicans moved to what is now Kansas and Oklahoma, but many stayed in Wisconsin. A group of Lenny Lenape Muncies joined their Stockbridge Mohican relatives in Wisconsin, and the community became known as the Stockbridge Muncie. With the Treaty of 1856, the Stockbridge and Muncie moved to the townships of Red Springs and Bartlemy in Shawano County. By the late 19th century, the Stockbridge Muncie, like nearly every Native nation within the United States, was assigned to a reservation. Theirs was largely pine forest that was difficult to farm. Reservation land was portioned and allotted to individuals and to families. Much of the land was sold to lumber companies or lost when the taxes couldn't be paid. By the 1920s, the Stockbridge Muncie were virtually landless and living in poverty. When Congress passed the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934, Native communities were able to obtain funds from the federal government to reorganize their tribal governments and recover some of their land. By the end of 1937, the Stockbridge Muncie had a new constitution with its first tribal president, Harry A. Chicks, elected. The Stockbridge Muncie community is still located on the reservation in Wisconsin, which currently includes a little over 17,000 acres of trust land and about 7,500 acres of non-trust land. Around half of the tribe's population of 1,500 people live on or near the reservation. In 1999, they established a Tribal Historic Preservation Office to formalize the work of protecting burial sites and other cultural areas in the eastern homelands. The major source of much of this introduction is the Our History section of the Stockbridge Muncie Community website. To help us learn more about the Stockbridge Muncie, I'm joined now by Heather Bruegel, who is enrolled Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and First Line Descendant Stockbridge Muncie and who is the Director of Education at The Forge Project. So hi, Heather. Thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for having me. Super excited to be here. Yeah. So my first question is often, how did you become interested in this history? I think perhaps in your case, the, this history is perhaps a little bit easier to understand. But you know what, what got you interested in, in studying history at all? Right. Well, I was really lucky when I was growing up. The fact I had a family member, a dear uncle of mine, who um, has since passed, but he was very influential in my studying of history. He was a citizen of the Stockbridge Muncie community, also known as Mohican Nation. And uh, I used to go visit him like every summer up on the res. Um, he had this beautiful cabin and he would tell me stories. Um, later on, as I got older, I realized he was telling me history stories, you know, about American early colonial history, U.S. history, um, things like that. And he uh, went to school. He went to college to be a teacher. Um, and then he did his student teaching and realized he didn't like it. And so he, <laughs> he, he didn't like that structured classroom setting. So he went on to do some some other really great things, but um, definitely instilled that love of history in me. So when I went to college, I knew that was what I was going to study. And I actually first started out in early colonial history, um, which I still am completely obsessed with. But then as I got older and started to come into my identity more of who I am and understanding my own history, that's when I really shifted my focus to Indigenous history. 
Yeah. And so I, I think this is interesting that you started with this idea of storytelling, because I, I think a lot about and talk a lot about on this show, what are the, the sources of what we know or what we don't know, what what the stories that get told and don't get told. So in in the history uh, of the, the Stockbridge Muncie people, you know, what what are the kinds of sources that you're looking at? Is is a lot of it oral history? You know, what do the written records look like? What What is that sort of whole universe of, of things to learn about this history. Yeah, so I think when you're looking at indigenous history across the board, I think understanding those oral histories is super important. Listening to your elders in the community, listening to your elders in 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 your family, but also uh, looking into archives that the tribes might have. So I was lucky enough to be able to have studied um, and researched in, but also work in at one point, the archives that the Stockbridge Muncie community has that was, um, you know, I worked in the archives for two years and it would be able to be surrounded by that history is super exciting and really cool because you, while oral traditions play a huge role, having those histories written down is also really important as well. And when you're talking about a group of people who um, are, you know, we're also known as, we're, we're the Mohicans, you know, Mohican uh, history as well, you know, combating those myths, um, such as last of the Mohicans and things like that. It's like, we have this rich history to talk about and we're still around, we're still here. So it's, it's very cool to um, be able to like use our own voices to combat those narratives. Yeah. What are the kinds of things that are in those archives that you were working in? Yeah. So we have things, um, we have written documentation of the language of the Mohican language. So when we were, um, we, we greeted Henry Hudson in 1609. So we were colonized very early on. And that also meant we were Christianized very early on. And so a lot of texts that we have relate to converting to Christianity. So there are catechisms and, and religious texts that were translated into the Mohican language, right? So we have, you know, some of those documentations down there. We have maps, we have, um, oh gosh, what else? We have writings from tribal members that talk about stories. We have books, we have all sorts of things that it's just it's, uh, we have, if you are ever in Northeast Wisconsin and you go to the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation and you go to the Tribal Museum and Archives, just know you're about to encounter the largest set of Mohegan archives in the world. So, and this is through community members back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, even today, traveling back out east to the homelands to be able to copy these records down by hand and bring those histories back to the community. So it was all community based, community run, community gathered and community put together. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So I, I think when I had previously thought of removal history, you know, it was very much like Trail of Tears. And in my mind, it was there was an act and then everyone was sent west and it was tragic and terrible, but it was a one time thing and it just happened. And that is not at all the history of the Stockbridge Muncie. So can you talk a little bit about what, you know, it, it, it's not this sort of one and done thing. What does this uh, this long journey look like? Yeah, so I think you're right. I think in terms of removal, when you hear Indian removal, you think Andrew Jackson, you think mm -hmm. Trail of Tears, you think of the five civilized nations um, and things like that. And that was awful and tragic. But I think you have to start back earlier. You have. So again, I said, you know, a lot of tribes in the Northeast experienced colonization in the early 1600s. And that would have not just been Mohican Nation, but it would have been the Haudenosaunee, which is also the Iroquois Confederacy. So, and I'm a citizen of Oneida Nation um, as well. So it's, it's important to understand we would have had that contact early on and would have, things would have been shifting early on. So um, Indian removal wasn't signed until 1830. But tribes in the Northeast and the New England part of the country were being moved very early on because we had the formation of the United States, right? We declared independence in 1776. And you had tribes, you know, the, the colonists that were coming in had to live somewhere, right? So you've got you know, the um, the eastern seaboard being populated with settlers coming in and tribes being pushed outwards. So it didn't just happen 
1830 when everyone seems to think it happened. It happened early on from that. And if you want to narrow it down to Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation, it was, you know, we went from basically the Hudson River Valley area, western part of Massachusetts, of Vermont, Connecticut, um, to uh, moving to Stockbridge, Massachusetts, then to New Stockbridge, New York, then to White River, Indiana, um, and then to Stockbridge, and then Kakana, Wisconsin, and then finally where the seat of government remains now in Boulder, Wisconsin, and that was in 1856. So our last removal happened in 1856. So, but that was just for the, that was the journey of an Eastern tribe. Your removal then continues to happen because it continues to move. You've got this idea of manifest destiny and mm-hmm. all of that. So with settler colonialism pushing westward, you then encounter the Plains tribes, such as the Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and all of those tribes being forced well, they really didn't have a place to send them. And then you have the inception of the reservation system. So you uh, earlier, you said homelands at one point. And so with this sort of long history of moving, uh, you know, what what does the, the Stockbridge Muncie tribe consider as, as sort of the, the homelands? Yeah, so the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation was located um, in what is now called the Hudson River Valley area. So from like Albany South. Um, south and east. So parts of New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so a big, vast area yes, all out yeah. here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think the the other thing, uh, you know, when I'm thinking sort of Trail Tears removal, uh, you don't see any agency among the Native people themselves, or at least, you know, that's not the story that is told. Um, but in the history of the Stockbridge Muncie, well, obviously, this is not their choice to be moved. There is still agency in the sort of way they are moved and the, the uh, alliances they make along the way. Can you talk about that piece of it a little bit? Yeah, so I think um, probably one of the best examples to use in in gathering support from other tribes or other tribes supporting other tribes is you have the example of the Haudenosaunee, which is also known as the Iroquois Confederacy Six Nations, right? So that would have been the Oneida, the Seneca, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, the Tuscarora, and I'm forgetting one. I always forget one. I don't know why. <laughs> um, it'll come to me. And so... You've got, and that was a powerful confederacy, right? And um, it's even been talked about in the formation of the government of the United States. But there were tribes, the um, the Mohawk, there it was, it was the Mohawk. <laughs> I knew it was going to come, but they relied on each other. And so there were been other tribes in the area that would have relied on each other too. Mm-hmm. So we're known today as the Stockbridge Muncie community. Muncie is um, also Lenape. So we had a strong alliance with the Lenape. We actually referred to the Lenape, um, who are also known as the Delaware, as the grandfathers. And so we had a group of Muncie Lenape who joined with us when we went into Wisconsin. And so that's how we became Stockbridge Muncie. Stockbridge comes from our settlement in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Um, And so it kind of just like eliminated the Mohican name, but we're very much Mohican nation. And so having those alliances really is helpful. In fact, on our move to White River, Indiana, we were supposed to stay with a group of Lenape um, and Miami and I think Shawnee that were in the area, but they had been coerced into selling um, the land that was there. So once, once we got there, there was no place for us to stay. But those alliances are super important. Um, and then you see later on in history, you know, with uh, Tecumseh, who is Shawnee, who forms this alliance with the Shawnee and the Lenape and these other tribes kind of in that Ohio River Valley area to kind of not just rise up against settler colonialism, but stop the expansion and kind of create a space for indigenous people. Um, and that's really important. So alliances are really good. But then we also want the Stockbridge Muncie community, um, Mohican Nation, we've also been known as diplomats. We had a lot of diplomats in our in our um, community, um, in our leadership and things like that. So, um, for example, one of our leaders, John Quinney, traveled to Washington, D.C. 
over 10 times to lobby on behalf of the Stockbridge Muncie people. And so all of our leaders have, you know, formed diplomatic relations, not with just other tribes, but with politicians in Washington, D.C. as well. Hmm. And I, I believe I read that uh, the Stockbridge Muncie also uh, were able to become U.S. citizens rather early compared to to some other groups, but that it maybe not everyone agreed that that was a good idea. You know, what uh, can you uh, talk some about that sort of dual role that, you know, there, there are these uh, settlers coming in, uh, trying to colonize, uh, offering citizenship, which maybe has some benefits, but, you know, on the other hand, these are the people forcing their way into your lands. You know, what, what, what are all those tensions look like? Yeah. So the idea of, and citizenship for indigenous people is a very complex um, idea. So yes, there was a congressional act that was passed in 1843 that granted Stockbridge Muncie community citizenship. On the surface, that looks and sounds like a really good idea. But what it did is it, stri- it stripped us of our tribal sovereignty. So prior to that, we were operating as sovereign nations. And that was on precedent when the United States did, the United States signed its first treaty with indigenous people and it was with the Lenape people and it was a treaty of alliance. But if you pay attention in history class, treaties are only signed between sovereign entities. Mm -hmm. So you have the Treaty of Paris, which was signed between the newly formed United States and Great Britain, acknowledging the independence of the United States. That treaty is something we still honor today, right? In 2021, we're still like, Treaty of Paris, it was signed, it was ratified, it, it sets the precedent for the independence of the United States. Same concept when you apply treaty the treaty signing between the United States and the Lenape. It sets that precedent that we are sovereign nations. So on surface, granting citizenship to the Stockbridge Muncie community sounds good, but it strips you of that tribal sovereignty. So John Quinney, who was, um, like I said, one of our great leaders, went to Washington, D.C. to lobby to have that overturned. And that ends up being overturned in the Congressional Act of 1848, because we... we wanted that tribal sovereignty and that is important to us, right? So it restores who we are as, as a sovereign nation. And that cause those two acts cause a split Mm -hmm. in, in the community. So you have the citizen party and the Indian party, literally. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, and it happened so long ago, but if you bring it up, there's still some tension right in the community so it's because like the citizen party was like oh you left you sold your land blah you know whatever and then you got the indian party who are like we are we stayed and we we powered through and so it's very complicated turns out though indigenous people were not then made citizens of the united states till 1924 so we were living under u.s empirical rule until 1924, when we were then made citizens of the United States. So it's a really interesting concept to think about. Yeah, definitely. Another thing that I think about a lot, I I think there's a lot of stories of when uh, colonial settlers come in, that that changes a lot about the economy and the culture for Native tribes because of, you know, various things that are introduced, uh, you know, material goods and all sorts of other disease and all sorts of other things. So there's that piece of it, but then also this group is moving. And so the, the type of agriculture, hunting, et cetera, that you might do in the Northeast and then Indiana and then Wisconsin is all very different. So what what are sort of all the adaptations that have to happen along the way to keep surviving as a community? I mean, you know, I I tend to say a lot that with the inception of trade goods, economic way of life for indigenous people changed drastically, mm-hmm. right? So you go from making your traditional goods to now working with um, iron kettles and mm. glass beads, contrary to popular belief, beading is not something we did all the time. 
<laughs> so let's just let's just nip that myth in the butt. But you know, we we learned how to adapt, right, to that beating that was happening, um, the fur trade. And, you know, trading these items for now these goods that we then become dependent on in order to survive because we're, you're almost giving up one way of life in order for another way of life, but it's not really giving it up. It's you're trying to adapt with the times and make sure that your people are fed and your, you know, your, your people are being taken care of and things like that. So as we're moving, you know, and tribes are for the most part, nomadic, right? We didn't just stay in the Hudson River Valley or we didn't just stay in the Berkshires. We didn't, you know, we moved to different places during different times of the years. And that is true for a lot of indigenous tribes, but you kind of stayed in the same area. Now that you're being forced westward, it's, it, things are different. Climate's different. The soil is different. You know, the reason Oklahoma became Indian country was because it was the crappiest land at that time until we mechanized farming. And then we realized, oh, wait, we can farm in this dry, arid, you know, dust bowl of, of a place. And so what happens then is you force the tribes under reservations. But it's also important to point out, too, that not every indigenous tribe was an agricultural tribe they weren't all agrarian agrarian societies mm -hmm. um and so you're you're adapting there are hunters gatherers some agriculture but it was all different and so now you're having to take these practices that you may have practiced in one area of the country and kind of adapt them to different areas mm. um and like because i and i can tell you the climate in northeast wisconsin is very different from the climate in new england <laughs> <Yes>. so it's <laughs> Um, so yeah, you're having to, to learn and adapt as you're going along. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I, earlier too, you mentioned uh, the introduction of Christianity very early because uh, being uh, coming into contact with Europeans early. Uh, I think at one point I was, you know, Googling and various things to, to prepare for this. And I saw like the Christian Indians or something, you know, so what, uh, what did that conversion experience look like? Did a lot of the uh, Stockbridge Muncie people convert? Are, are they still Christian? You know, what, what does that look like? A lot of people converted. Um, and um, when I, you know, so Massachusetts had these places, a lot of, not just Massachusetts, but places in New England had these towns called praying towns. Mm. And it was, um, they were usually missions that were set up where um, the various tribal nations would go and, and convert. So like, for example, Stockbridge would have been Mohican Nation and Lenape and Oneida and Brotherton and Narragansett and Mohawk. And all these different tribes would have come into the area to learn about what Christianity is and and try to, and say like, oh, maybe we need to be doing this or whatever. Um, and so I think a lot of, when I look at those early conversions, I think I look at them more out of conversion of necessity, out of survival, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're seeing what the prosperity that the settlers are having, and you're seeing the prosperity that you are not having. So you are like, maybe there's something to this Christian God, right? Mm -hmm. And so with that, a lot of people convert and that's carried with them. Um, there are a plethora of indigenous people today that um, identify as Christians and practice various religions. Um, I think you'll see a lot of Catholics and a lot of Lutherans because um, that seems to be um, like the two that also ran um, boarding schools. Oh, yeah, yeah. So when we're looking at non-government run boarding schools, you're looking at religiously run boarding schools. And the Catholics and the Lutherans um, were like right up there with, with that. And so, of course, religion played a very big role. Um, but you're also seeing two younger generations coming up, not necessarily rejecting that Christian religion, but looking back to the traditional ways mm -hmm. and and practicing traditional religion traditional ceremony and things like that. And um, I, you know, definitely had a deconversion process um, in my early 20s. I was I was raised Catholic, but I'm no longer uh, a practicing Catholic. And, um, but I don't necessarily practice 
traditional religions as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of, I'm like, a, I don't know. I'm, I'm not like, I have my beliefs, but it's, um, you know, for me, it's just taking a firm stand on not practicing colonized, what I see as colonized religions. Mm -hmm. And this is not to dog on anyone who practices whatever religion. I'm very much a big to each their own. You do you. But I think, you know, when I think of Christianity and conversion and, and religions, I think of, I think more so of the harm that was done as opposed to the quote good that may have come out of it. Yes. Was there good? Absolutely. But to me, there was more harm done than good when it comes to, to the conversion of Christianity and a lot of tribes in the East Mohican nation included Oneida included um, a lot of those early traditions and things were lost because we were Christianized and colonized so early on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I think there have been more recent efforts. Uh, there have, of course, been sort of land back efforts all over the country with different tribes. Um, but the Stockbridge Muncie have been uh, uh, working on getting land, uh, I believe, in New York State. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that and, and what that looks like? Yeah, so the Stockbridge Muncie community, and this was uh, this was probably the last thing I assisted with before I left my position there at Stockbridge Muncie community was the returning of Papskinny Island, which is an island that's located in the Mahikanatuck, you know it as the Hudson River. And um, this island is significant because it's named after Papskinny, who was a leader of ours in the 1600s. Um, and he lived on this island. And this island had been under threat since like the 1980s, 1990s for possible development. And so Open Space Institute came in and 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 scooped the island up and stewarded it, tried to help protect it from development because they are a land conservation organization, great organization. And so, you know, over the pandemic, they approached the community about, hey, you know, this isn't this isn't our land. We we have no problems being stewards of it to protect it, but it really should go back to its rightful owners. Mm -hmm. And so the prior to that, the island was listed as a nominee for National Registry for Historic Places, but it was still coming under threat of development. And so the side of this island that the nature preserve is virtually untouched. And so it very much would look like what it looked like in the 1600s. Like if Pap Skinny himself were to come alive today, he could be on the island and he would see that it, it didn't really change much from when he was when he was alive. And so through an agreement, the the land was donated back to the community, Stockbridge Wednesday community. So uh, Stockbridge Wednesday community is the owners of the land again, uh, working in partnership with the Rensselaer county to help maintain like the walking trails that are already on there because it is a nature preserve and people do walk through it and we don't want to stop that right we don't want to stop that but i think it's more uh in terms of talking about ownership of it is it's tribally owned and that was so that was just finalized early this year but i think in terms of like land back because you know you had that uh case in supreme court case in oklahoma mcgirt versus oklahoma where the supreme court ruled that rightfully so the eastern part of Oklahoma is still Indian country um, and people are like oh well all these things are going to change nothing is really going to change what yeah. changes is the ownership of the land so it's not like we're going to kick indigenous people out and be like you can't be here anymore <laughs> and and people are so worried about that and we're like no that's not what's going to happen it's just like it's it's the rightful return of the land I was uh, over the summer, I did a talk at, in South Dakota at the Crazy Horse Memorial, where I, you know, talked about how the Black Hills were stolen and the fight to get them back. And it was weird that I was doing this in a facility, uh, a museum that people come to. And it's a great museum. I, su I support the museum that's out there. I think they're wonderful. But I was basically saying this museum shouldn't exist and you shouldn't be here. <laughs> and this is why. And so I was very worried about that. And um, I had a, you know, somebody asked me, it went over very well, because somebody did ask me a question. They're like, well, what happens? And I'm like, nothing really happens. The developments and the people who live here 
still live here. I'm like, but what changes is the stolen land is returned to who it belongs to. Yeah. And I think that the core, that is what um, needs to happen across the, the, across the country. You need to have land back unequivocally, no strings attached. Yeah. So tell me about your current work at the Forge Project, which looks so fascinating. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm super stoked. Um, as as we're recording this podcast, I am, by the time your viewers hear, I will be fully in upstate New York. I'm currently in Detroit, in between the move. But um, yeah, Forge Project is, um, it's so exciting and I'm so, I'm so happy to talk about it. Forge Project is an initiative that's set up in the Hudson River Valley um, to support those displaced by settler colonialism i.e. Indigenous people. So we have, uh, and we're doing that through a plethora of different ways. I serve as the Director of Education for Forge Project, and that encompasses setting up programming, you know, whether it is at Forge itself or virtual programming, because we are moving into winter, so I'm not going to make people drive around (laughs) upstate New York in the winter. So we'll do virtual programming and and stuff like that. But we'll also have small in-person gatherings as well, um, where we're bringing in indigenous scholars, authors, educators, um, artists, those who are, you know, really doing great things in the indigenous community for people to learn from. And then we also have a fellowship where we are awarding those in Indian country who are working in land justice, climate justice, cultural awareness, Um, who are really doing things in their community to bring back some sort of awareness. And so we understand that that work can be very taxing. And sometimes, you know, it's hard for you to do that work if you have to do uh, a nine to five job. And so we created a fellowship that allows you a few weeks out of the year to come to Forge to do that work uninterrupted and you're awarded a sum of money that gives you, like, you don't have to stress about it, right? You know, your mortgage is still being paid, your rent is being paid, you can still get groceries, but you can do this work that we understand is so important. The other thing that we want to do, that we're doing with Forge is raising the awareness of Indigenous artists. Indigenous artists don't get the same, they don't get the same coverage as non-Indigenous artists. And there are some great Indigenous artists out there, you know, in in the world. And so we have started to buy art by contemporary indigenous artists that is then also used as a lending collection to facilities across the country where um, that can be also used to showcase this art, but also be used as a teaching collection. So you're not just looking at this great piece of art, you're also learning about, um, uh, I don't know, whatever tribe that the art the artist comes from. So, you know, you're learning about the Ho-Chunk or the Oneida or, you know, whoever. And it's, it's you know, it's not a, a private collection. It is a teaching and lending collection, which is so awesome. And then we are also working with a farm in the Hudson River Valley area, Sky High Farm. And they, um, you know, are, they have farm of their own, but then they're also farming on the property at Forge. And they're really great because all the food they grow goes to um, shelters and food banks in the area for free. They keep nothing. And so I think that's huge. So that's also incorporating work that we're doing on the indigenous side of things of food sovereignty and seed saving and, and stuff like that. So there's just a lot at Forge that we're doing all of the time. And I'm so excited to be part of it. Yeah, no, that's really exciting. And I love the the passion in your voice while you're talking about it. It's wonderful. Uh, so you. I'll be sure to put uh, in the show notes for this uh, link to Forge Project so people can can check out. Yes, yes. Yeah. Website, follow us on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is there anything else you wanted to make sure we talk about today? I think overall, what I would like um people to know is you know native americans exist indigenous people exist more than just in the month of november and i think you know we need to incorporate those histories into our everyday vernacular 
and 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 conversation and talking about things. Um, you know, I as a historian have said for a very long time, you can't understand the history of the United States if you don't understand first the indigenous history of the United States. And I think that's very important. And I think understanding that is key to being able to understand how we got to where we are in this year 2021. There's a lot happening. There's been a lot happening since 2016 and beyond, but the events that happened in 2016 and then some did not just come up out of the blue, right? So understanding that history that we have, and there's going to be a process of unlearning that has to happen. And you're going to get mad and you're going to, you're going to and it's going to be painful because you were taught things for, you know, 50 some odd years, that that's how it went. And you're learning now that it's just not true. And that is okay. So I think understanding that is key to moving forward and to healing. And I think, you know, acknowledging that indigenous history first is a key step. And understanding that we do exist outside of the month of November, but also stopping to think that while we have November as Native American History Month, Thanksgiving falls into that month. And, and understanding the pain and the trauma behind Thanksgiving is, is interesting as well. You know, um, I think from Indigenous Peoples Day through like December 1st is, is always a very painful time for for indigenous peoples and, you know, understanding that, you know, we're still here. We've still got a lot to do. There are some reckonings that are coming, especially with this boarding school investigation initiative put forth by Secretary Deb Holland, who is Laguna Pueblo, uh, Secretary of the Interior. Um, and so it's, it's important to understand that people are going to be learning a lot, I hope, in the next months, years, and being open to it. I just want people to be open to learning and understanding what is going on and, and read and educate yourself. Um, use Google every now and then and, <laughs> <laughs> and don't rely um, solely on an Indigenous person to tell you our history. It's exhausting after a little while. So do a little research before you, you approach us. We want to help you, but I'm also an educator. So it's like, read your stuff first, <laughs> then come to me. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, Heather, thank you so much for being so generous with your time today. Uh, I This has been a really great. My pleasure. And I am so glad to uh, have learned so much about uh, this Stockbridge Muncie specifically, but, you know, about uh, the, the larger, really the whole story of settler colonialism and all sorts of other stuff um that yes there's been a i was a, a child of the 80s and so i've been doing a lot of unlearning over the past couple of years and i, I know I I am, to i'm glad to, to do it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so thank you, and uh, I'll put links and things in the show notes uh, so people can can find you on Twitter and can find more about the Forge Project. Yeah, well. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Forever, awesome. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends. Mm-hmm.